All right, so um, we're in the Hall of Faith chapter, one of my favorite chapters of the whole Bible, Hebrews 11. And the reason we're in the Hall of Faith chapter is because we're in James 2. What? That makes no sense, right? Yeah, because in James 2, James was telling the, um, the believers, remember it was the first book of the Bible, um, New Testament written, and he's telling the Jewish Christians and then the Gentile Christians that, you know, faith without works is what? Dead. dead. And dead means what? Useless. Good. Dead means what? Useless. useless. It means useless. Okay. Faith without works is useless. Now, remember, we don't come to Jesus by our works. There's nothing that we could possibly do to come to God the Father. It can only be through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and how he already forgave our past, present, and future sin, right? And we're like, I believe, and you're the way, truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through you, and whoop, in the family, right? In the family. So then, as your faith continues to grow up, what happens is works spill out of you, right? Works just continue to spill out of you. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like the seed in you, the Holy Spirit, the seed in you continues to grow and grow and grow and grow. And as you water and nurture it with the water of the word, the water of the word, your non-negotiable face-to-face time, right? The water of the word, and it just starts pouring out of you because you actually desire to do good works. That, that, that is just who you are because of who he is in you as you're yielding to him. So we went through Abraham's faith, right? Amazing, uh, the faith of Abraham, right? God said it, I believe it, that settles it, and he left not knowing where he was going, right? We went through his faith, and we went through um, Enoch and Abel, right? And today, and, and um, Rahab, and Rahab, and today we're going to go through Noah, through the faith of Noah. Now, I'm going to ask you to look at this story way differently than you've ever looked at it before. We're going to look at it through his faith. Not just what happened in the story, you know, the animals that came in by twosie, twosie, twosies, right? Okay, we're not just going to look at it by this quote-unquote cute story. Like, for instance, let's see, our oldest will be... 25 coming up this next week. Okay, so when we decorated her nursery and did her whole nursery, it was done, back then it was really in to have one of those wall, what's that, like a border, like a, a border, and it was a border that was like this light turquoise and light pink and whites and everything, and it was all Noah's Ark, right? It was all Noah's Ark. And so the whole, her whole room was done in like all whites and, and lace and everything, and then the Noah's Ark kind of theme, right? And you know, so cute, so cute. All right. I don't want you to look at it like that. We're going to look at it through the faith of Noah. And we're going to then ask ourselves, do we have that faith? Do we have that faith? Just like last week where we took time and we went through to, to talk about where we are in our faith, right? And wherever you are in your faith, that coincides with what? where you are in knowing God, right? And knowing his promises. The more you know him, the more you know his promises, the more your faith does what? Grows. The more it grows. The more it grows. Because you know him. You know him. You know his promises. And you step out on that water and you keep walking because you know him. And you keep knowing him. So this morning we're going to dig into Noah. Uh, We're going to be in Hebrews 11 and then we're going to be in Genesis 6 as well. So let's begin in prayer. Lord Jesus, thanks so much. For another day, you awakened us, and we know who awakened us, and that is you. And so we know whom to praise, we know whom to give thanks to, and that is you. And so, Jesus, uh, we are here this morning to um, delight in you, to uh, give you praise, to hear from you, to have the Holy Spirit go in and teach us all truth. Teach us all truth because you know us more than we know ourselves. And so, Jesus, um, we are so grateful that um, you are here in our presence because you're in us and you're about us, God. And so we thank you. We thank you that we have resolved to be here this morning and that we can um, learn of you, know you more, grow up in our faith, uh, be changed once again, uh, and walk out of here um, 
being, um, being a person that knows that the focus is on you and the circumstances are back here, God, and it's not the other way around. That we can keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so, Jesus, we are asking, Holy Spirit, we are asking uh, that you would speak to us in general uh, through your word, God, and through my words that you have given to me, God, but specifically that you would go to each of us. You know what we need to hear. You go to each of us and specifically speak to us because we are listening. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. I didn't hear you. Amen. All right, way better. Amen. Need more coffee? Need more coffee? All right. All right, let's go to um, Hebrews 11. First, and we'll just read Hebrews 11, verse 7. Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his what? Faith. faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. faith. One more time. By faith. Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. faith. Okay? So let's dig into just this at this point um, about Noah and about Noah's faith. And then we're going to go into uh, Genesis 6 and, and go in deeper. Noah was divinely warned of things he had never seen. vision, God spoke to him, dreams, whatever. He was divinely warned of things he had not yet seen. Okay, so he was warned of something that had never happened before. He was warned of something that had never happened before. And so his faith, trusting the unseen, knowing his God, right, his faith was shown in not merely agreeing that the flood would come, but in doing what God told him to do regarding the flood. It wasn't that he was just agreeing about this warning, but he then did what? He, w he was going to do what God told him to do regarding the flood. It says he was moved with godly fear. Right? He was moved with godly fear in the New King James. Okay, So that means he's going to do something about it. Because what have we learned in James 2? Faith without works is, is dead or is useless. And so he's moved with godly fear. Because real faith, real faith will always do something. Real faith will always, always do something, okay? And we know this because we've been in the book of James, and it's repeated that theme over and over and over again, okay? So when he says he condemned the world, that doesn't mean that Noah's walking around and, you know, going up to Denise and grabbing her and saying, you're going to hell in a handbasket, okay? It wasn't, he wasn't doing this, all right? It says you condemn the world, okay? You shouldn't think of him as a man who preach sermons of condemnation of hellfire and brimstone to the world, okay? Instead, he just, he, what he did, he, he was a, it was his mere conduct of this godly man that was following hard after Yahweh God, doing what he told him to do, sometimes without preaching at all, okay? And, and you can just then feel the condemnation of the world. Fast forward to today, okay? Fast forward to today. When people don't do something about conviction, there comes condemnation. Okay? When you're convicted, when you're convicted, when you're convicted about something, I'll give you an example. Being around my mom, I loved being around my mom. I loved being around my mom. We were great friends for this. I loved, but I didn't like all the conviction that 
just poured out of her. She didn't have to say a word. She was just one great big light and salt, right? She didn't have to say a word. And I was just so convicted, so convicted. And so I felt condemnation. She wasn't condemning me. There's no condemnation in Christ. But I felt condemnation because I didn't see her as an aroma of Christ. Remember, he says, we're an aroma of Christ to those who are being what? Saved. To those who are being saved. They're like, oh, I love that. Oh, I want what you have. I want what you have. To those who are not or who are, are, are feeling the conviction but are, are wanting their own way, what happens there? We become a what? A big P-U, right? We become this big stench to them. Okay, and that's what was happening as Noah is following hard after Yahweh God and building this ark for 120 years, mind you. Building the ark, right? And people are looking at him as, oh, what a fool. Oh, what a stunt. Right? And there's condemnation because there's such conviction, but they don't want anything to do with it. So they feel condemned. They feel condemned. Let me give you another example. Uh, my, I used to live in Shorewood before I got married, and my sister, Marini, moved from uh, Madison area to Milwaukee area. And um, she was not walking uh, uprightly with Jesus at the time, which she will tell you now, so it's nothing I'm telling um, out of story. And she said, I always felt like, you know, really convicted around you. I wanted to be around you, and I want, you know, you'd say, let's go out to eat, let's do this, let's do this, you know, let's go to, you know, this concert, let's do this. And she goes, I'd want to, but then it'd be like, you know, I would just see you as this great big, you know, bubble of conviction. And I would be like, I want to do what I want to do kind of thing, right? And so she felt condemned around me. Nothing that I said, but she felt condemned around me. We go to a lot of functions at Brian's company, okay, and, and uh, you know, um, he's been with that company for 30 years, so you know we've done a lot of things and we know a lot of people. And and so what happens is that we can be at these corporate parties and we notice that people can be around us and everything, and all of a sudden they're not around us. They're not around us <clears throat> because they know, like you know, we're these Jesus freaks, or you know, wasn't she the one that went on that fish? She wasn't she? Didn't she like wasn't she like this? One? Right, right, and and that's okay. That's okay. I mean, we're loving on them. We're, you're sharing with them and everything. But, you know, there's conviction. And when you don't do anything about conviction, then you feel then condemned, right? You feel condemned. Uh, I've mentioned before, we've been to packer parties, like in our neighborhood kind of thing. And we're talking and sharing everything. And all of a sudden, we notice that, oh, we're not like in the in crowd over here that we're all doing this and everything. And, and so, you, right? Because why? Because there's conviction. There's conviction which is a very good thing because God's always the initiator. He's always, always going after you, right? He's the hound of heaven, right? And we're light and salt, and light pushes back what? Darkness, Darkness. without us even opening our mouth. That's a good, good thing. And that's, what, that's who Noah was with his faith. There was, you know, they felt condemned by Noah's faith by Noah's faith. Okay, because Noah did all that God commanded him to do. He did all that God commanded him to do. Noah is this great hero of God. Okay, he, he's, this, he's this great faith walker of God. Okay, he's, he was outstanding, outstanding in righteousness. In fact, in Ezekiel 14, 14, Daniel, Job, and Noah are mentioned, the three of them together, of these outstanding um, people of righteousness who just proclaimed and walked as righteous in, in God, okay? And so this righteousness salvation. And then in 2 Peter 2, 5, he was declared a preacher of righteousness as well, okay? And so um, it says in 2 Peter 2, 5, when God protected Noah as he was building this ark, okay? But listen carefully. It seems... It, yet it seems in this 120-year ministry, pretty long ministry, right? 120-year ministry. It was a ministry, building this ark, 120-year ministry. No one was saved except his family, eight people. 
All the rest perished in the flood. 120 year ministry. Following hard after Yahweh. And no one was saved except his family. When God's eyes went to and fro the earth looking for those who are loyal to him and his eyes no, you're my guy. You're my guy. You're my guy. You know, I've spoken with Joe Briscoe numerous times, you know, and it's like when, when you're in ministry, when there's fruit all around you, you can't burn out. When you see, you know, in, in, a, in a lady whose eyes just light up because they just now know Jesus and, and they know that they know and they've put a stake in the ground and this is how they're going to live and, and you can see then their family changes. You can see their mother-in-law change or their mom changes. You can see how, you know, their, their kids are changing. You can see how their husband, you can just see how God's working, right? When there's fruit like that, you can't burn out. Noah, 120 years. Ministry, building the ark. Nobody except his family. God used Noah for one of the biggest judgments he's ever going to do in the world and one of the biggest salvations that he's ever done. Noah. He's my man. He knows me. I know him. Come on, let's do this together. Let's do this together. So now let's open up to Genesis 6. So it's the first book of the Bible, all right? Genesis 6, because that's where it starts uh, about Noah and about the flood. So let's uh, move this over here and grab this. Because right now, God is calling Noah in Genesis 6 here. He's calling Noah. And he's talking about the wickedness of man in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah. So let's read uh, 6, 1 through 8. When men began to increase in number on the earth, and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, personal name of God, the great I am. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Every, only, all. And the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. Da, 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 verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, let's stop there because I want you to understand what's going on in the world during the pre-flood years. There was intermarriage going on between the sons of God and the daughters of men. You have to remember that during these years of rapid population, rapid population expansion, and perhaps because of the long lifespans in the pre-flood world, Okay, so there's rapid population going on. Like one of the things that God said to go forth and multiply, man took that seriously. Okay, so there was rapid population going on. All right, and and there was a problem going on with ungodly intermarriage. With ungodly intermarriage, and it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Okay, so the sons of God. Uh, there is either demons, angels in rebellion against God, you know, Satan's minions, angels in rebellion against God, okay, or uniquely demon-possessed men, 
okay? And the daughters of men are what? Are human daughters, are human women. Now we know that the sons of God, that, that word, that phrase, sons of God, okay, clearly refers to angelic creatures because it does time and time again in the Old Testament. It was used three other times in the Old Testament in the book of Job, and uh, it was when it said Satan and his angels, okay, came and presented themselves before God, and God said to them, uh, where have you come from? Where have you come from? Like he didn't know, right? Where have you come from? And they said, well, we've been roaming around the world, you know, we've been roaming around the world. So sons of God means angelic beings, okay? And the Septuagint, you know what that is, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy 5, the Septuagint, okay, translated sons of God as angels. And those ancient translators clearly thought that the sons of God referred to angelic beings. Go to Jude 6. There's only one chapter in Jude, so it's just the verses, Jude 6. We studied Jude probably about five years ago. Jude 6 tells us that the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own habitation. Jude 7 says they sinned in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. And here in Genesis 6, as in Sodom and Gomorrah, there was an unnatural sexual union. Now, it is absolutely useless to speculate on the nature of this union because the Bible doesn't tell us, so we don't speculate, okay, other than what we know. Okay, whether it was brought on by something like demon possession or whether these angelic beings had power permanently to assume the form of men, it's not revealed. That is not revealed. Okay, but we should understand. We need to understand the occult is filled, filled with sexual associations with the demonic. Filled with it. And there are those today who actively pursue such associations in the occult. So Jude 6 makes it very, very clear what God did with these wicked angels. Okay? He said they are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day for not keeping their proper place. They didn't keep their proper place, okay? Which then reminds me that the sinful pursuit of freedom puts you in bondage. Right? The sinful pursuit of freedom. You have a free will, right? But if you want to sinfully pursue stuff, what does that do? Puts you in bondage. Puts you in bondage. No, no, no. I want you to be inside this. This is a circle of blessing, Margo. I want you in here. I don't want you to go out. I want you to be here. This is a circle of blessing. Just like our... Our horse has pasture, wonderful pasture. She's in a country club. Everything's taken care of for her, okay? If she steps out, guess what? There'll be all kinds of bondage for her because she's not able to walk in that area. That's a good, good thing. But their sinful pursuit of freedom will put you in bondage. Exact same thing that these angels had to happen to them. So I want you to open up to 1 Peter, which is all the way back. Uh, let's see. After James, after James is First Peter. Go to First Peter three, because it tells us Jesus went to these disobedient spirits in their prison and proclaimed victory on the cross over them. Basically, the na 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 boo boo, which of course he didn't do, but that's my my Margot message there, right? It's like, I'm here, and here I am, victory, victory. So let me just put it into context for you in 1 Peter 3, beginning in uh, verse 8. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with un insult, but with blessing, because... To this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For 
Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. Noah. In the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Is that a hallelujah? Is that the best? Right? So we see that he... In those three days before he was raised from the dead, goes down in spirit and tells the spirits, here I am, here I am, absolutely am, and um, I have victory over the cross, over you, over you. Now, there's extra biblical books, okay, that are not in the Bible. One of them is called Enoch, okay, so from the book of one Enoch, uh, it says this. And it came to pass that the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. They took unto themselves wives and each chose for himself one and they began to go unto them and to defile themselves with them and they taught them charms and enchantments. And they became pregnant and they bare great giants. And there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. We can deduce why Satan sent his angels to intermarry, either directly or indirectly, with human women. Satan tried to pollute the genetic pool of mankind with satanic corruption. To put something like a genetic virus to make the human race unfit for what? For bringing forth the seed of the woman for the Messiah to come. The promised one, the Savior, Jesus, okay? It says in Genesis 3.15, right? I put enmity between you and the woman, right? And he's going to dash the head, right? And so, and so he is always scheming. He can't create. He can't do anything, but he wants to pervert it. Wants to pervert it. So if I can pervert a whole genetic pool, right, of satanic, and it's like demon, you know, and genetic into this, and this, 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 and it's just continuing. They make giants, this, this. Well, no way can the Messiah come through the seed of a woman, can't come through a seed of a woman, okay? The Savior could not be born of a demon-possessed mother. That could not happen, okay? And so if Satan could succeed in infecting the entire human race, okay, the deliverer could not come. The deliverer could not come. And you know what? Satan almost succeeded. He almost succeeded. Almost is only good in what? Hand grenades and... And what's the... Horseshoes and horseshoes and horseshoes, right? Satan almost succeeded. The race was so polluted. The race was so polluted that God found it necessary to start again. 
with Noah and his sons. It was so polluted. And to imprison the demons, like we learned in Jude, that did this so they could never do this again. So now we see God's response to this great wickedness. He says, uh, my spirit's not going to strive with man forever. My spirit's not going to strive with man forever. Okay, God did not allow the human race to stay in this rebellious place forever. Praise God. Praise God. Right? Praise God. Okay? All the more reason that we need to say today's the day of salvation, right? All the more reason you say today is the day of salvation. Right? All the more reason that you want to respond to him now instead of waiting for another day. And I want you to know when he says 120 years, it doesn't mean the, the outside lifespan of man. That's not what that means. What it means is that's the time left until the flood. That's the time left until the judgment, 120 years. And so Noah was building this for 120 years. The flood happened 120 years after this announcement to Noah. And when it says that there were giants in the earth in those days, that refers to the unnatural offspring from the union between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Okay? The demonic element of their parentage. And so they were big. And the reason they were called mighty men of old is because they were giants. Now, there was great, great wickedness in Noah's day. In verses 5 through 8, we see that he says, Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every, only, continually. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This says a lot. This says a lot. It means that there was no aspect of man's nature not corrupted by sin. There is no aspect of man's nature not corrupted by sin. I can't even think of a more emphatic uh, way of saying the wickedness of the human heart. And Jesus said in Matthew 25, excuse me, Matthew 24, 37 and 38, he said, as in the days of Noah, so will it be for the coming of man. For the coming of man. In other words, the conditions of the world before the coming of Jesus will be like the conditions of the world before the flood. Well, what did that look like? Well, we just read. We just read in Genesis 6 1, there was exploding population. There was exploding population. Genesis 6, 2, there was sexual perversion. All kinds of sexual perversion. Genesis 6, 2, again, there was demonic activity. Demonic activity. Genesis 6, 5, there was constant evil in the heart of man. Right was wrong, wrong was right. Constant evil in the heart of man. And we're going to see in Genesis 6, 11, that there was widespread corruption and violence. That's what was going on as in the days of Noah. And he says that before the coming of Jesus, the conditions of the world will be like before the flood. You do know that every generation thinks that this is the generation that Jesus will return, right? Right? I mean, seriously, my mom, who moved to heaven, which I can't believe 15 years it's been now, uh, you know, she was like, you know, I mean, wow, I mean, Margot, it's got this, this, this. I mean, she would not believe in 15 years how much more evil it has gotten. She, she just wouldn't believe. We're right is wrong and wrong is right. And this, that she just, I mean, it would be, it would be mind shocking to her in just those 15 years. And so the Lord then said, he looked around and he said, you know what, I'm really sorry that I made man. What a sad, sad verse that is. I'm really sorry that I made man. I, I'm grieved in my heart that I made man. 
God's sorrow at man and the grief in his heart, that's striking to me. I kept steeping on these verses and steeping on these verses. And remember, the Holy Spirit who now lives in us, we can grieve him. We can grieve him. And God was grieved. He made man in his image. He wanted them to have a love relationship with him. Meanwhile, gave them a free will so they could choose to have that love relationship. And what did they choose? To walk in their sinful ways. To walk in their evil ways. This doesn't mean that creation was out of control. Okay? Don't ever think that creation was out of control. Nor does it mean that God had, like, hoped for something better, right, but was unable to achieve it. Okay, that's thinking with their little peanut brain. Not as God. Okay? And so God knew all along how things would turn out. He knew all along how things would turn out. He foreknows. He's omniscient. He knows. He gave him a free will. He knew this. But he already had a rescue plan in place. He already had a rescue plan in place. And don't you love most of his rescue plans as we've been reading? It only takes one to join him. Just one. Abraham, Moses, Noah. Just takes one. One that finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. Don't you want to be that one? I want to be that one. I want to be that one. When he looks at to and fro all the years, it's like, you're, I mean, come on. You're it. Let's go. Let's go. It wasn't, it wasn't that, you know, he didn't, he was like, oh, are you kidding me? This is what happened? It wasn't like, oh, I could have had a V8. That's not what happened. He knew how things would turn out, but he always had a rescue plan in place, okay? Clearly, our text tells us that as God sees his plan for the ages unfold, it affects him. It affects him. It grieves him. It grieves him. God is not unfeeling in the face of human sin. He is not unfeeling in the face of human rebellion. It affects him. That's why he says, when you delight in the Lord, right? You agree with him. You obey him. You're walking in the light. You're walking by faith like Enoch, right? And everything. It's just like, ah. It just brings joy to my heart. On the other side, you're walking in rebellion, walking in sin. He's grieving. He's grieving. Do you look at him like that? Everything you say and do either puts a smile on his face and he's like, oh, that away, good job, or it grieves him. I don't want to grieve him. Just being a human being, I'm sure, grieves him enough where we have that propensity. But he made us in his image. He made us to be able to have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that lives in us. That's the Holy Spirit. He, we can yield. We can yield. We can yield. We don't have to yield to our flesh unless we've been feeding our flesh, our bad dog, and then the bad dog wins. But we grieve him. We grieve him. And he was sorry that he had made man. He was grieved in his heart. And then the great verse, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay. How many of you guys know Laura Snyder from MSO? Okay, raise your hand. MSO, okay, amazing woman. She plays a great big bass, you know, the boom, 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 boom bass, right? And then she has this contralto glorious voice. And when I had been at Elmbrick for years, she would be in a lot of plays, a lot of different stuff, and she's this beautiful African-American woman that would wear like sort of um, a shift kind of a neat dress that would like flow, right? And she had these great big beautiful eyes, huge beautiful teeth. And she'd go, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace. And you'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this spiritual, right? And she would just share about Noah's faith, right? In this, and you would, just, you, would, you would just want what he had and, as she was singing that. Just amazing. And it's taken from this scripture. Noah 
found grace, found favor, undeserved favor in the eyes of the Lord. Well, God commanded the earth to be cleansed of this pollution, he found one. He found one. That's all he needed. One human agent to begin life again, to begin it again. Just one. He found that, and he found it in Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah didn't earn grace. You can't do that. You can't earn grace. Grace is freely given. You can't do that. It's by grace through faith that we know him, right? He can't earn grace. None of us can, okay? He found grace, okay? No one earns grace. We all find it. Why? Because he's always shedding it abroad. He's always giving it away. He's always like, here's my grace, here's my grace, right? And he goes after you, and he goes after you, and he goes after you. He initiates, and he initiates, and then you receive and find it. How great is that? How great is that? And it was true then, and it's true today, where Romans 5.20, which my mom would tell me over and over and over again when I was walking uh, amiss, she'd say, Margo, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. I didn't know you'd have to go that low, Margo, right, to be able to look up and come to him, but I knew grace would always catch you. Because it does much more. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So let's look at verses 9 and 10, because now God is calling Noah to build the ark. All right? Whoops, I'm in 1 Peter. Go back to Genesis. Genesis 6. Genesis 6, and we will read um, eight, er, 9 and 10. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right, let's stop there a minute. So God is calling Noah now to build the ark. And he's got the sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right, so Noah was a just man. He was a righteous man. And it says in New King James, I like how it uses these words, perfect in his generations, okay? So this description of Noah is unique to him. Not only refers to the righteous life of Noah, but also to the fact that he was uncorrupted. He was uncorrupted by Satan's attempt to sow something like that genetic virus, okay, um, in the genetic pool of mankind. He was uncorrupted from that. And we could translate that perfect in his generation says, Noah was pure in his genetic profile. So God could start again with him. So God could start again with him and with his family. Okay? Now, did Noah live a perfect life? No. Okay? No human being does. Okay? He was declared righteous. He was declared righteous. God regarded him as righteous. His character was a righteous one. God would look at him and declare him as righteous. You are obeying. You are following me. You are you know, doing your sacrifices and this, this. And so you are declared righteous. By faith, I see you. Okay? So we knew that we know, I should say, that Noah has righteousness by faith. Because as soon as the floodwaters dried up, God sent a great big wind, great big wind, great big wind, right? And the floodwaters were dried up. You know what Noah did? He left the ark and he took the clean animals. Remember, he took seven of each of the clean animals because he continued to sacrifice, right? He took the clean animals and he went and he built an altar on Mount Ararat unto God. Immediately. Immediately. Soon as the floodwaters dried up and he left the ark, he offered sacrifices. That's in Genesis 8.20. How great is that? So we know that we know that Noah had the righteousness that is of faith because he knew that was of God. So Noah had three sons, great names, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? You can name your next kid that. Oh, Ham, come on. Right? So I want you to know that they're going to figure in a significant way because God's going to use them for the foundation of the rest of the human race. 
Okay, so let's look at 11 through 13 because we're going to see the corruption of the earth and the grace of God. The corruption of the earth and the grace of God. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them, whew, both them and the earth. Let's stop there. So the earth is corrupt. It's violent in every way. And God told Noah he was going to judge the wicked along with the earth. He was going to judge the wicked along with the earth. God told Noah that he has this intention to save Noah and his family. In the midst of the corruption, in the midst of the judgment, there's also grace. There's also grace. Remember back as we studied for two years in Isaiah, right? He kept telling, repent, you're my people. Come back to me. Turn around. Repent of your evil ways. Repent of all the corruption. Repent. Come back to me. Turn around. Repent. Repent, right? There was always, always his grace. He was always calling them back. And they would come back for a little bit, and then they'd go off and do all their idols again. No, come to me. Come to me. Repent. So there's always grace, okay? So instead of wiping out the entire race, God preserved a remnant which is what he does, which is what he does. He always preserves a remnant, always preserves a remnant. Okay, so let's look at 14 through 16, because now God is telling Noah, listen, you need to build an ark. Verse 14. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. Okay, let's stop there. So he's telling them, here are the blueprints. Here's what I want you to make. I want you to make the ark, okay? And so he tells them, him, him specifically, make yourself this ark. In other words, this means this is Noah's project. See, when God shares with you that this has got to go or this has got to do or you got to stop there or you got to begin this or whatever that's your project okay don't make it your husband's don't make it your kids don't make it your friends don't delegate it this is him talking to you this was a big project and he said noah this is you you're not supposed to contract this out to someone else noah and be the general contractor over it you're building the ark. I'm trusting you. You're trusting me. You're building the ark. And then he tells him exactly how to make it. Exactly how to make it, okay? The ark was as long as a 30-story building is high, right? It was, uh, it was you know, what do you say, 450 feet. How many have seen the ark encounter? Did you see the ark encounter, right? Is it amazing? I mean, it's made exactly like the biblical measurements, right? And so, um, you know, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Okay, so quite frankly, what he's describing is not really a boat, okay? It doesn't have a sail on it. It doesn't have a motor on it. He's basically describing a barge. It just floats. All that baby does is float. It has nothing that to propel it. It just floats. It just floats, okay? It's not to sail anywhere. It's not to zoom anywhere. It's just a big float boat, okay? After all, an ark is really, is a chest. It's not a ship. An ark is a chest, okay? And, and, and it's like that ark looked basically like a, like a shoebox shape of the vessel. Now, it was plenty large enough. I did a lot of research on this because I got really excited about it. Got, it's plenty large enough. It was about the size of the Titanic. Okay, and it had 18 inches, you know, opening, um, one half meter, all the way around the top. And it wasn't until 1858 that a bigger boat was built. Okay, 
The ark was certainly big enough to do the job. Now, if the ark carried two of every family of animals, there'd be about 700 pairs of animals. But if the ark carried two of every species of animals, there would be around 35,000 pairs of animals. Now, the average size of a land animal is smaller than a sheep. Okay, the average size of a land animal is smaller than a sheep. So the ark could hold 136,560 sheep in just half of its capacity, which would leave tons of room for what? People, food, water, whatever other provisions that were needed. Now, God just says to Noah, Noah's walking by faith, total faith, I know God, I trust him, and God just says, you're going to make this. This is what it's going to be, and this is how it's going to work. But God had not yet told Noah why. We always want the why, don't we? We always want the why. He hadn't told them why he must build an ark. At this point, at this point, all Noah knew was that God will judge the earth. And he was supposed to build a big barge. And if you remember, it hadn't rained yet. It was a terrarium effect. In fact, if you go in Genesis 7 and 8, read it this week, right? Where God allowed in the flood the firmament of the heavens where he held all the waters to come down. And he allowed all the waters of the seas to come up under the land. Whoosh. So it was not only a flood that came down, it was a flood that came up. And it went two and a half miles over mountains. Just floating. Just floating by faith. Just floating. You guys, picture yourself in that barge. Picture yourself as Noah 120 years building this barge. And in the beginning, not even knowing why, not even knowing there's a flood. What, 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 what does that look like? What does that look like? What does that look like? And he, he, he didn't know why. He just knew there's going to be judgment on this earth and I'm supposed to build this barge because it hadn't rained yet on earth, okay? It was reasonable to suppose that Noah didn't know what God even meant yet. What he even meant yet. And he says, you're going to make this, Noah. And the Bible says Mo Noah made it. Isn't that so great? He just walked by faith and he made this, okay? He made it, okay? Now, beyond the Bible, there is rich historical evidence, okay, of the reality of Noah's ark. Hundreds of, of different um, sightings or, or different stories and everything, and I picked out a few. I just want you to hear a few. Around A.D. 75, Josephus said the locals collected relics from the ark and showed them off to this very day. He also said all the ancient historians he knew of wrote about the ark. In A.D. 180, Theophilus of Antioch wrote the remains of the ark are to be this day to be seen in the mountains. An elderly Armenian man in America said that as a boy, he visited the ark with his father and three atheistic scientists in 1856. Their goal was to disprove the ark's existence, but they found it and became so enraged they tried to destroy it, but could not because it was too big and had petrified. In 1918, one of the atheistic scientists, an Englishman, admitted on his deathbed the whole story was true. In 1876, a distinguished British statesman and author, Viscount James Bryce, climbed Ararat and reported finding a four-foot-long piece of hand-tooled timber at an altitude of about 13,000 feet. You know, Mount Ararat is in southern Russia area. Six Turkish soldiers claimed to see the Ark in 1916. In the early part of this century, a Russian aviator named Vladimir Rokovitsky claimed the discovery of Noah's Ark. He was stationed in southern Russia near the Turkish border and Mount Ararat. 
As he tested a plane, he and his co-pilot flew over Ararat and discovered on the edge of a glacier what he described as a boat the size of a battleship. He said it was partially submerged in a lake and he could see there was an opening for a door nearly 20 feet square, but the door was missing. Rokovitsky told his commanding officer and an expedition was dispatched to find the Ark and photograph it. The report was forwarded to the Tsar, who was soon overthrown and the photos and the report perished. In 1936, a young British archaeologist named Hardwick Knight hiked across Ararat and discovered interlocking hand-tooled timbers at a height of 14,000 feet. During World War II, Two pilots saw and photographed something they believed was the Ark on Mount Ararat. I could go on and on and on and on. There have been many, many more recent attempts to find and document the Ark, but it's always hindered by politics or by surrounded by controversy. It's sort of cool, isn't it? How it's only like parts and this, this, and God hasn't really, right? Isn't it? Don't, don't you think? How, how he just, it's like his timing, his way, his timing, his way. So back to Noah building this, right? He's building it and he says, look, you need to cover it with pitch inside and outside. That means it'll have the cypress wood waterproof. Okay, so you cover it with pitch and so that'll waterproof the wood inside and outside. Okay, which then would make the ark to be preserved for a very, very long time. Okay. Now, it's possible God still has a purpose for the ark, right? It's possible to use it to remind us of a world of past judgment, right? And then perhaps a future judgment. In fact, 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7, relates a future judgment to the judgment of the flood, saying, Unbelievers willfully forget the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Funny how we just want to forget, right? We just want to forget. Now, this was really cool, listen to this. Because of the mention of pitch, and pitch is a petroleum product, okay? Most people think, you know, in, um, that in the Middle East, that John D. Rockefeller looked and found oil in that region based on this verse, because it was covered with pitch. And that's a petroleum product, right? Okay, so let's go back to Noah's faith as he's building this. Let, let's look at 17 through 21 uh, of chapter 6. So God says, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. How are they going to come? come They're going to come. Right. You know, God does that, right? He just does that migration. He'll just tell them, right? Creation knows their creator. Just, just go. Just go, right? I mean, even... I looked out on our lake the other day, it's partially open. I'm like, are you serious? That same goose is back, right? I mean, we relocated these geese, right? And the same goose is back, this migration, right? And so he easily could have told them that this is where you're to go. Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And here's the great verse. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Can you put your, your name in there? Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Can you put your name in there? Can I? Margot did everything just as God commanded him. That's why he's in the Hall of Faith chapter. It was his faith that built that boat. He kept his eyes on the one God said it. I'm following him. 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 Can you imagine Noah hearing from God 
and God saying, everything that is on the earth shall die. We can only wonder what Noah felt like when that announcement was made from God. God called Noah because he was a righteous man, because of his faith, to an essential role in the greatest judgment and the greatest salvation the world had ever seen. Greatest judgment and greatest salvation the world had ever seen. And because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, he got to be a part of that. And despite that dramatic judgment coming, God made a covenant with Noah. God made a covenant with Noah, right? And he said, look at you and your family will be saved. And I'm going to use Noah then to save a remnant of each animal, of each animal, so the earth could be populated with people and with animals after the flood. So he tells them, make sure you take enough food, make sure you take enough this, make sure. Can you just imagine him having to gather, having to do this, right, and everything? And he's doing this all by faith. All by faith. Remember, it hasn't rained. What does this look like? He's building a monster barge that has no sail on it, no motor on it. This is it. And Noah obeys. And he obeys. In the New King James, it says, Thus Noah did. Thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. When given this staggering job to do, Noah did it. How about when God just asks you to go across the street and talk to your neighbor and bring him some? You know, the neighbor that bugs you, the neighbor that's not very friendly and this and this. And you think it's a staggering job. Or someone in your family, you know, your extended family. You know, staggering job. You didn't hear Noah complaining. You didn't hear him rebelling. He simply obeyed. 120 years, he obeyed. He was 600 years old when he was given the call to build the ark. He lived another 350 years. He lived to 950. And so he did. I mean, an awful lot of material in years in those words. And so he did. Right? And so he did. Yet Noah did not shrink from what God told him to do. I can imagine, like, what? I mean, even 50 years in, you'd be like, you know, you know, this is, oh, God, you know, really? I mean, what, what is this for? I mean, really? He never, he didn't shrink from what God told him to do. Because he knew his God. Because he knew his promises. Because he kept his eyes on the unseen. And it didn't matter the why. He just wanted to please him. And God takes care of everything else. He kept his focus. He kept his focus. According to all that God commanded him, so he did. And the Bible presents Noah as a great hero of God. Great hero of God. In the Hall of Faith chapter. As I mentioned, he's an outstanding example of righteousness in Ezekiel 14, 14. He's a preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2, 5, right? And, and Noah, as he said in Genesis, condemned the world, condemned the world by offering salvation in the ark that the whole world rejected. Remember, the door was open. Anybody could come in. Noah's out for 120 years. And do you know the faith of Noah when they got, 
God called them into the ark. Come into the ark. Come into the ark. They walked in the ark. God's presence is in the ark, right? And they're in the ark. And for seven days, they're in the ark, and it still hasn't rained. Now, what a, does he look like a fool? Can you imagine his own sons maybe jeering him? Well, I did. Seven days. Doors open. God's inside the ark. Noah and his wife, three sons and their wives inside the ark. Animals, oh, they've been in there. <laughs> We're not missing out. And then God shut the door. God shut the door. Revelation says when God shuts the door, no man can open it. When God opens the door, no man can shut it. Salvation was in the boat. Salvation was in the boat. And God shut the door. And by faith, Noah walked and was saved. He and his family. But his 120 year ministry was the only people that were saved. Largest judgment, largest salvation that the world had ever seen. The work of building that ark was laborious. It was dangerous. It was costly. It was tedious. And it was seemingly foolish and ridiculous. Seemingly. See, we're on the other side. It was seemingly foolish and ridiculous. Especially when all things just continued in the same posture and safety for so many scores of years, right? 120 years he's working on. This is seemingly ridiculous. This is, this is foolish. And I am sure that Noah, without doubt, was ridiculed and jeered by the song of many drunkards. What a fool. What a fool. Drinking songs about him, what a fool he was. I'm sure he was the sport of many of the jokes, right? Many of the jokes. Seemingly foolish. Seemingly ridiculous. And then the drop of rain fell. And it was too late. And it was too late. See, the same thing happens with us. Really? I mean, people look at us and, oh, how ridiculous is that? This Jesus stuff and this thing and how they're walking, that really? Oh, that simula that's foolish. That's foolish. That's ridiculous. And we just keep on keeping on. Right? And in the beginning, what did we learn about? He, he was a preacher of condemnation, not because he was the one. It was the conviction that was happening. Which is a good thing, especially if you respond to it. It's a good, good thing. If you don't respond to it, you feel condemned. Because he wants you to get in the boat. He wants you to get in. He wants you to have salvation. 120-year ministry, only eight people in the boat. And then he got out. After 150 days, two and a half miles above the mountains, right? Remember he sent a raven out first, right? And and the raven goes out and everything, and a raven probably saw the carcasses and didn't come back. He's like, yum, 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 right? Carcasses, yum, that's my food, right? Seven days later, he sends out a dove, right? Dove's not going to eat yum, 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 right? Dove goes to the trees and stuff. 
and, and comes back with nothing. Sends him out again. Dove goes out again seven days later, comes back with what? Little olive leaf. Oh, so there's habitation now. Okay, okay, because God caused a big, big, big wind so that the flood would recede, right? And that great big barge just boom into the mountain, Mount Ararat. And then the dove came back with the olive and then he sent him out, sent him out again and the dove never came back because there was vegetation. And then he knew it was okay to walk out. And we know he did by faith because he immediately made an altar with those clean animals that he had brought to sacrifice unto the Lord. And then God wonderfully restarted it all. And we're a part of that. And we're a part of that. Don't you want to have the faith of Noah? It's not just about the little story in this list and a little cute story that read to our kids. It's about his faith. It never would have happened without his faith. He trusted. He didn't have to see why. He knew Yahweh God. And he's written in the Hall of Faith. Just imagine him coming out of the boat, sacrificing to God, and all the animals coming out. And that's it. There's eight people in the animals. And his big God. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Well, he takes one. Don't you want to be that one? I do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that uh, Noah did everything as commanded by you. And it was a staggering job. But he kept on keeping his eyes on you. No wonder he's mentioned as a heroic act of faith in the Hall of Faith chapter. God, help us to walk, not by a little faith, but by the faith of Noah, by the faith of Abraham, by the faith of Enoch, by the faith of Rahab, by the faith of Abel. God, speak to us. Speak to us this week. We may think these are staggering things, but God, you've already gone before us. It's already done in the heavenlies, just like you had this done. And Noah just joined you in it. That's what our life is to be. And so teach us, God. Teach us not to, to, to ask you why, but just because we know you and your promises, that's enough to just keep doing the next right thing, the next right thing, until we see you face to face. We love you, Jesus. We pray, praise you and we pray to you in your name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen.